Okay, we're going to get to the last slide now uh, for this unit and to finish up with this chapter and get you ready for your next test and everything. Uh, you should have gotten done with the uh, video on completing the information about uh, the different ways on how researchers are able to get into the brain uh, and to be able to see some of the different things that we've been talking about uh, whether it's uh, by use of a uh, MRI or an fMRI or a P a PET scan or CAT scan uh, so hopefully you've gotten on that video watched it and then got that information outlined onto your notes then so you have that for the test okay the last slides uh, that we're going to go through here uh, the first one here we're going to just briefly get into uh, is actually talking about the second communication system of the body uh, and this kind of it, it parallels with and works with in conjunction with the uh, central nervous system and also the peripheral nervous system in that it uh, sends messages back and forth kind of like uh, exactly what those two systems do uh, it uses this system by basically dealing with the nerves and the uh, neurons that are being fired just like the others but the difference here is what uh, the endocrine system does which is this body's second communication system uh, the endocrine system works off of our emotions and so when we are having a emotional state uh, and our bodies are reacting to that, that fight or flight mechanism in us, then it is our bodies, not just our brain that's communicating with our body, but also our body sending messages to our brain. And this is the communication system that does that. How it does that, instead of getting into a long discussion about it, basically the endocrine system acts a lot like the central nervous system in that when it has uh, information coming into it from the senses from outside the environment there it interprets that information and then it will send out uh, through its chemical messengers uh, secreting different types of chemicals to make our bodies and to make our, our behaviors react in certain ways uh, these are not called neurotransmitters though as if they would be up in the brain these are called hormones which you probably have heard of before these chemicals are uh, influence our behaviors and our emotions like the central nervous system they do affect the whole body unlike the, nerve, the central nervous system endocrine messengers are slower and take longer to have the effects on our bodies and behavior to wear off so in other words uh, if you think about it you know when we're thinking and processing and reacting with our brains we are doing it at incredible speed you know the ability to talk walk move all the things that we do that our bodies enact our, our uh, I'm sorry that our brain enacts our bodies to do but when we're having these emotions, uh, sadness, joy, anger, all those kinds of things, if you think about it, when we're having those, they stay with us a lot longer. When you get in a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, that emotional charge inside of you, all of those bent up uh, frustrations, the anger, the hostility, the clenching of the fists, all of those kind of things, uh, because of the chemical hormones that are flooding through our system, that stays in our bodies a lot longer and has a lot more of an effect. On the other side of that, it takes us longer sometimes to get those in motions and to get those chemicals pouring through our bodies in order for that to take place so that's what that kind of talks about there uh, this process of basically having the chemicals of the hormones stay in our body system is longer this is called uh, endocrine hangover and it's the inability to get over an emotional reaction very quickly and we're going to talk a lot more about this when we get into the unit on stress the influence of the endocrine uh, deals with such things as our growth, our reproduction, our metabolism, all of those things. And basically the two key areas of the endocrine system that works on this is the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Okay, last couple things about the brain then, just to kind of finish up with, as you can see the brain's working out there on the video, uh, is dealing with the idea of plasticity which means shaping and basically what that means is that our brains are not only incredible in terms of what they do but also in terms of what the brain itself can do um, now if you get injured you know brain injury a car accident those kinds of things and you have damage to the brain uh, a lot of times that damage is not going to be able to be re uh, replaced or refixed uh, repaired and that's because the damage is too extensive However, just like a cut to a finger uh, does heal over time, so does our brains when, they, when it does have some damage done to it. So the structural and functional organization of the brain is much more flexible than what psychologists and scientists at first thought.
One of these types of plasticities is called structural plasticity. It's the aspect of experience that can sculpt features of the brain. Now, in other words, what that means here is right now you guys are learning this unit, hopefully, on the brain. And hopefully by going over the slides and going over the presentations and maybe doing it a couple times, reading the chapter, doing the activities in class, you're learning this stuff. And hopefully for the test you will do very well. But as you're learning this material and as it is actually getting into your brain and you're building these memories of it, your brain is changing. The, out, the outer layer of the brain, which is called the cerebral cortex there, which hopefully you got from the project we did, uh, those folds in there, actually they make new folds when you create new memories and you build new concepts, new skills, uh, new procedures comes into your memory system. You actually develop new crevices. It's just like again from the video we watched where you take a newspaper and you crumple it up and it has all those crevices in it and let's say that you know uh, you take the newspaper and you twist it some more and you turn it some more and you build more crevices in it. That's what's going on in your brain. That's called structural plasticity. It's the ability to create new features of the brain by learning new material. The second thing about the brain that we just have in the recent years discovered about it's called functional plasticity and that is where the brain can actually heal itself or it can reorganize itself and this happens where you might have some damage to the brain by a concussion or by a hit or just through chemical use or drug use or other things like that environmental uh, disasters and things that can cause some damage to the brain. Basically your brain just kinda like it's same thing as if you're driving along and all of a sudden you see a detour on the road and you have to go around different direction to get to where you're going. Same thing with your brain. Sometimes when that brain sending those messages through the neurons, sometimes it hits a detour. Uh, the synapse cannot jump across to the other dendrite of the other neuron to send the message on through. So instead it will send the message on to another neuron which will then will have to send it to a different route. But the information does get through and eventually you do get the process built. Uh, and that's called functional plasticity. So think of that as just basically creating a whole new system of, of a thought process on being able to do that. Now eventually your brain also by, will repair itself. It will build new synapses from those that are damaged and it can eventually then create a new connection that it wasn't able to do before. The last thing is neurogenesis and that is a process by which the brain actually can repair uh, and also create new neurons in the brain and that is a whole new process that has not been developed before or noticed before that it does. We always thought that the brain basically had the same amount of neurons when you were born and then you slowly lost them as you, as you got older and you, then you died and that's no longer true. Okay, we're going to get into the last part then, the left brain and right brain, and talking about this research being done on that. Uh, the left brain and right brain came about because of two men. One was Paul Bracca, uh, the other uh, was the name of uh, Wernicke. Uh, basically, these two men did research on the brain. Uh, as they were doing research, what they noticed is some of their patients that they were trying to treat and deal with had difficulties in dealing with either talking, speaking, uh, being able to understand, being able to comprehend, those kinds of things. So what they did is they did some studies in which some of the patients that they had who had died, they did autopsies on their brain. And what they discovered is that the left side of the brain predominantly is developmental, dealing with our mental processes of uh, the analytical thought, logic, language, those kinds of processes. And that the right brain is basically more dealing with our intuition, creativity, art, music, those kinds of things. And so they were able to develop dysfunctions of the brain and to make that determination. Uh, Bracca went on to discover that a left side of the brain and left hemisphere there, there's a special part of the brain that deals basically just with language and with speech itself and being able to say the words or be able to uh, pronounce them. And that is now called the Bracca area. It was based upon his research. Wernicke also did some uh, research and was able to discover where the part of the brain on the left side deals with comprehension, the understanding of language. So there's two different parts there. So basically you could get someone who has some damage to the brain and they may be able to speak fine and talk the language but not have any comprehension or understanding of what it is that they're saying or what somebody else is saying to them. You may also have somebody who can understand the language and understand what's being told to them but they may not be able to speak 
because they damage the BRCA area of the brain. So to, it used to be thought that we, it all worked together in one thing. Well, now we know that it's not. The brain has special, special functions then. Roger Sperry and Michael Gazanga did some more studying on this called split brain research. And what they were able to discover and basically they did this by, with, with patients who had uh, difficulties or had uh, ailments that would be dealing with, uh, in some cases, seizures and those kind of things that they, they actually cut the corpus callosum there, which, which connects the left and right hemisphere. And by doing this, what they were able to determine is to figure out what exactly happens with the left and right side of our brain. And what they discovered is that the left hemisphere of the brain actually controls the right side uh, of our bodies and the right hemisphere of the brain actually controls the left side of our body but is more prone towards the visual spatial colors those kinds of things so you would have somebody who the idea there is that somebody who is basically left-handed or that writes with their left hand and does things, they would be someone that more is dominated with the right hemisphere, which would lead them to being more uh, maybe creative, more maybe uh, artistic, or someone who's much more outgoing, much more uh, freer in their ideas and thoughts. Whereas somebody on the right that does dominant right side activities is going to be dominated more on their left side, which would make them more analytical. That was the theory that Spiri and, and Gazanga came up with them. And they did about a lot of studies on this to, to come up with uh, proof on how this would play out and how this did it. And basically their research was able to show um, that basically we do have a split brain when it comes to that. Um, now when it comes to the idea that do we only use one part of our brain or one half of our brain more than the other? No. Uh, we use both sides equally. So even though maybe I'm, I'm speaking right now and talking to you guys and you would say well I'm using my left hemisphere to do that, that is true, but my right hemisphere is still doing it as well because my right hemisphere would be coming up with either some type of uh, language uh, that would be maybe inspirational, the, the word choice or the, the tonage of my voice, uh, the fluctuation of my voice, all of that would be more of a right brain function. So even though my speech is left brain, they work together. So to say that you're only working half of your brain when you're doing something is totally false. You're using both sides of the brain at the same time. Finally, then, the last thing to get into just a little bit is about dealing with our disposition about, okay, we got our brains, we have all this processing, we have all this stuff about it, where does it come from, um, you know, are, are we basically born with what we have for our brain, or do we develop our brain, is it through environment, or is it through uh, is it through uh, nature? Is it through our, our parents' genetics? Studies have been done on this over and over, and what they have been able to conclude pretty much is that your brain, uh, the intelligence you have, the dispositions you have towards your personality, towards happiness, towards depression, uh, all of those things are basically about 60% your parents and grandparents' genetics, in other words, and about 40% comes from the environment then. How they get this is through a number of studies, uh, family studies there by, by comparing within families themselves, uh, your brothers, your sisters, your, to your parents and, and cousins and things like that, to determine whether or not a trait runs through a family, but also how much of that trait is influenced. Uh, another type of study that's done quite a bit is twin studies, where you take identical twins and fraternal twins. So an identical twin is 100% genetically the same. So if they're 100% the same, that would mean that if uh, genetics played a 100% role in who we are, of our personality, intelligence, and everything else, then one twin would be exactly the same in intelligence as another twin. And they would do studies in which they would have find these twins that were basically separated at birth by adoption and then they would bring them together and test them and even though environmentally they were no longer close to each other they weren't living in the same house or in the same uh, city or anything like that they found that they were still relatively very high correlations of these twins being very very close to each other in terms of their likes dislikes personality all of those things but there was some difference between the two now fraternal twins which were only 50 percent identically the same they discovered there that again it was a very broad span of these fraternal twins that were raised either together or apart in terms of how similar they were in fact identical twins raised apart from each other were more like each other than fraternal twins living together. That's how close genetics plays with that.
And the last one is dealing with adoption studies in which they found that uh, children who were raised by adoptees, basically who have no genetic connection to their adoptive parents, actually were very similar to them in many ways in terms of their personality, their behaviors, their likes, their dislikes. So again, environment does play a very inducive role in the development of all of us and in development of our brains then. So those were the three studies that deals with this idea of dispositions and the fact that we do we inherit parts of our traits but we do not have a destiny in which we are locked into what we're going to become. Okay, that pretty much finishes the slides and that finishes your presentations. Now if you want to go back and watch them again, that'd be great. Um, and then hopefully you've been able to get quite a bit from the information and help you it will help you on the test.